Father, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for, for this day, for allowing us to come here and to study your word and to learn about who you are. God, we pray tonight that, Lord, this would be more than just uh, words on a page, Lord, that would be more than just um, ideas or concepts, but Lord, that we would see that this is who you are and this is that how you have revealed yourself to us. Lord, that we can know you in a deeper way. Lord, that you might change us and grow us in our faith. Lord, I pray that, um, that you would be with us tonight. Lord, we know that, um, that we are just mere men and that we can't understand the deep things of God. And Lord, I'm totally inadequate to be able to explain these things to your people. And so Lord, I just pray tonight that your Holy Spirit will come and that you would Give us uh, illumination that we would be able to understand your word, that we would see it clearly. Lord, that you would help us to understand. Lord, that you would give us um, focus in our minds and, and that we would know who you are and that we would know you in a deeper way. Lord, that you would be glorified in us and that we would uh, grow in our faith and our knowledge of you. Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to start tonight in Psalm 145 so y'all can... Turn your Bibles there. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of change things up just a little bit um, from the way that we've been doing Wednesday nights. Um, and I'm, I'm doing it because of this topic being so vast and so deep, I guess. Um, but I'm going to ask that we hold discussion and questions to the end. Um, and I'm, do, I'm asking that because if we chase rabbits or if we uh, get into other discussion, then it's going to stop us from being able to get through each of the things. And I'm going to leave time at the end for us to have discussion and have questions and those kinds of things. Um, but I just, the way this topic is, when we go through this, it's really easy to get off on side trails and then we won't get to finish. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, I've been studying the attributes of God for on and off for like five or six years now. And, um, and I was going back through some of my notes and reading some notes that I've made in books that I've read, uh, getting ready. And I just was reminded in just at the weightiness of this topic again and how inadequate I feel standing up and trying to explain who God is when I don't even understand who God is myself, right? Um, and, and we're never going to understand who God is. But I know I can never do him justice. And so as I stand up here and get ready to explain the God of the Bible, the God of creation, I know that it's never going to be good enough. It's never going to be enough to explain everything because I can't even comprehend it in my own mind. Um, but I do ask that God would just smile down on us and that he would use my weak attempt and that he would glorify himself in it and that he would reveal himself to us and that we would be changed by God's greatness and that we would know him more deeply. So that's got to be our prayer as we go through this. Um, and I also want to point the, the, the point of preaching and Bible study and teaching isn't for you to memorize everything I say or to memorize all of my points, right? Even two months from now, I don't expect you to remember the titles of my sermons. Um, but the point is, is to be confronted with God's Word so that it changes our heart, so that we are different when we've encountered the God of the Word, right? That's the whole point of preaching. Um, like we've been doing Ephesians on Sunday mornings, and I hope that by the time we get through Ephesians, that when you go back and read it one day, you'll have a better understanding of the book. Um, but, but the overall point of it is for us to encounter God through His Word and Him to change us, not for you to memorize it. I mean, I, I use notes because I can't even remember everything I want to say to you. So I can't expect you to remember everything I say, right? Um, but, but preaching is about God's Word changing our hearts. And so we're going to work through these topics. Some of them are going to be deep. Some of them are, um, are hard to comprehend. But I think that with prayer and with perseverance, I think we can work through these things. Um, and if there's something that's not clear, you can ask. I know I said I want you to kind of hold questions to the end, but if something's not clear and it's not explained right, then, then say something so that I can explain it clearly um, or try to explain it better. So the point of this is that we have an encounter with God, not just so that we learn a bunch of facts. All right? Um, and I want to say, starting out, knowing God starts with faith in Jesus. Right? I think we all know that. If, if we learn every fact that there is in the Bible about who God is, and we don't believe in Jesus, then we don't know God. Right? We still don't know God, even if we can quote everything. So we need to believe in Christ. That's the only way we're going to know God. But knowing God is also not void of those facts. 
We still have to know God and what He has said about Himself in His Word. God has revealed Himself to us in the pages of the Bible. And the only way we're going to know Him is if we know this book. Alright? So it's not void of those facts, but it has to be in connection with faith in Christ. It's the only way we're going to know God. Um, and next week, what we're going to do is we're actually going to deal with the, the first real attribute that we're going to look at is going to be that God is incomprehensible. That God is so vast and so large and so great that we can never fully comprehend all that He is. Um, but at the same time, God is a personal God and we can know Him. And we can know Him in a personal, real way. Um, but for tonight, what we need to know is that we can know God through Christ and that we're brought into a right relationship with God through Christ and through God's Word. So if we want to know God, we have to know His Word. That's the only way we're going to know Him. And that's why this, this book is my most prized possession. I always know where my Bible is because it is my most valuable possession that I own. As we study through uh, who God is, we're going to move through uh, Scripture and we're going to work through all these different attributes. And the prayer is, is that we're going to encounter God. Um, so just to start with the most basic thing, let's first just read Psalm 145. And I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the, the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. So, the picture that we get in Psalms is the, of Psalm 145 is praise for the greatness of who God is. And so that's, for me, that was the best place for us to start, is thinking about how great God is, and that we have this opportunity, because of Christ, to know this great God. And we should stand in awe of that. We should stand in awe and wonder that we have an opportunity to know the one true God. Um, so when we talk about studying the Bible, when we talk about knowing God, the word for that is theology. And I know that's almost a bad word that people hear, but theology means, theos means God, and ology means the study of. So theology means the study of God. And that's what we want. We want to know God. Um, now, They've broken theology up into such a major thing now that the study of God is actually called theology proper. But theology is supposed to be just the study of who God is. Um, but they've included all kinds of stuff in it now. But we have to remember that what we think about God is the most important thing about us because it directs everything else in our life. If we have wrong views of God, then we're going to go astray in our faith. We have to know who God is and we have to think rightly about who He is. Um, maybe we don't know all of the fancy terms but we need to know God. And that's the point. That's what I mean by theology. Not that we need to learn all of those 50 cent words, right? But that we need to know God. That's what theology is. Um, so the first thing on your sheet, um, I'm going to give you another definition. That first word there is attribute. It is a characteristic that is inherent in a person. So we're talking about the attributes of God. Characteristics of who God is. Um, we would call that a personality trait if it was a, another human being. Um, but the difference between us and God is that what God is, He is entirely. So He isn't divided up into parts. Have you ever took a personality test online or something like that? Um, if, you, if, you, if you ever took one, uh, it'll give you results back and it'll say, you know, you're 30% extroverted and 70% introverted or you're 25% feeling and you're 75% thinking um, and it gives you these breakdowns. But God isn't like that. So when we talk about the holiness of God or the righteousness of God or the the love of God, it's not that God is 25% love and 30% holy and 20% just. God is those things in its entirety. So God is love. God is holy. Okay, It's not, it's not like we're uh, baking a cake and we're putting a bunch of ingredients together to make one cake. All right, That's not what we're doing when we talk about the attributes of God. So each of these things stands on their own. Um, and that's actually number one uh, on your sheet is God is not made up of different attributes that equal the whole. What He is, He is completely. So what God is, He is entirely. So God is totally just and He is totally merciful. And both of those to the same degree. So one is not more important than the other. They're, they're equal and they're the same. Um, in theology terms, this is called the simplicity of God. And it doesn't mean that God is a simple being. What it means is, is that God is in a combination of a bunch of parts. 
He is, he is who He is, right? That's what He said to Moses at the burning bush. I am that I am, right? And that's what we're saying. God is what He is. He is love. He is holy. He is just. He is righteous. He is good. And those are all things that are all true equally about God. Um, so when we talk about attributes, we divide them up. I divide them up into two categories. There's a lot of different ways you can divide them up. Um, but I think the best, ways to, the best way to do it is the first one um, is on your sheet, number two, shared attributes. These are characteristics God has that man can also have, but to a lesser degree. So we have shared attributes, right? Think God is love. So people can also love, right? We can love, but not to the degree that God loves. Or we can be kind, but not to the degree that God is kind. So what, these are attributes that we can also have that God has, just not as great as God is. Number three, non-shared attributes. These are characteristics of God that only He has. That only He has. So for example, God is the only being in the universe that is all-knowing. He doesn't share that with anyone else. God is the only being in the universe that is all-powerful. So those are characteristics that only God possesses. But then we say, well, why does all that matter, right? Why do we need to know all of these things about who God is? Well, I mean, can't we just pray to God and that just be it? Or why go through the study of who He is and, and pick apart all of these scriptures and pull all this stuff together to try to figure out who God is? Why study the attributes of God? Number one on your sheet, we are studying these attributes so we can worship God in truth. Because how can we worship a God we don't know, right? How can we pray to a God that we don't know? How can we pray to a God that we don't know anything about? A, a God that we don't know it can't be trusted, can't be served, can't be worshipped. And the study of who God is leads us to true worship. It instructs our worship and it directs our worship so that we're worshiping the one true God. Um, in, in Hosea 4.6, it says this, and this is a familiar passage to you. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. And so he says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, we're destroyed because of this knowledge. What knowledge is he talking about? Well, in Hosea 4.1, at the beginning of the chapter, it says, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, no mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. And God says the people were being destroyed because of their lack of knowledge of who He is. And so the thing that was leading to the destruction of the people was their lack of knowledge of God. Why? Because they were worshiping idols. They were breaking the covenant that they had made with God and God had sold them into slavery. God had sold them to be taken by Babylon because they were worshiping false gods. And he is saying, you are being destroyed because of your lack of knowledge, because you don't know who God is. We see this in, all throughout the Bible. Um, in Leviticus 10, uh, Aaron has two sons, and their names is Nadab and Abihu. And they offer a strange fire to God. They worship God in a way that he hasn't instructed them to. And fire comes out from the altar of God and kills them, because they, were, they weren't worshiping God in truth. right? Uh, we see that with uh, Uzzah. He touched the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, it was coming in on the cart and tilted, and Uzzah reached up to steady the Ark, but then it killed him because he wasn't supposed to touch the Ark. He assumed that his sinful hands was cleaner than the dirty ground, right? And he presumed on God, and he did something he wasn't supposed to because he didn't act in truth. Um, and so we see this all throughout the Bible. Now, when we hear the word worship, when we say we must worship God in truth, we oftentimes associate worship with music or a style of music. But that's not really what worship is. It's oftentimes is associated with music. But worship is more than music. Uh, wor worship is way more than music. Um, on your sheet in letter A there is worship. Worship is an acknowledgement of who God is and then a life lived in light of that truth. That's what worship is. It is an acknowledgement of who God is. And so if we don't know who God is, if we know nothing about God, it is impossible for us to worship Him. And so if we're worshiping and we don't know God, then we're actually worshiping a figment of our own imagination. That's actually idolatry. And so we must worship God in the truths that He has given us in Scripture. That's the only form of worship that is true. And then because we know who God is, we then live in light of that truth. Like the famous verse in 1 Peter, right? Be ye holy for I am holy. 
knowing the holiness of God drives us to live holy because we know that's how the Lord is because that's what He requires of us. Stephen Lawson said, a high view of God will lead us to a lofty worship of Him. A growing understanding of His character will lead to holy, righteous living in the pursuit of His will. So worship in the Bible is always connected with revelation of who God is. Um, Listen to Psalm 100. And this is what it says. It says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. And so he says that we should worship the Lord with joy and with gladness. But why? Because of these truths that we know about who God is. Because we know that God is good and He is merciful and he is, His truth endures forever. And so we worship God in light of the truth of who He is. And then that leads us to live a certain way. Number two, um, we are studying the attributes of God because knowing God is what eternal life is all about. Is what eternal life is all about. In John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus said, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Jesus says that eternal life is knowing God. And if you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about eternal security, once saved, always saved. And we said that eternal life begins the moment you believe. The moment you're saved, you, you have eternal life, right? And so if the point of eternal life is to know God, and eternal life started when we got saved, then we should start knowing God now and learning who He is. This is what is going to make eternal life so great, right? Heaven and the new Jerusalem and the streets of gold and the pearly gates, all of that eventually would get boring after a long time in eternity, right? You, you would get bored with gold streets and pearly gates. But it's the pursuit of knowing God and His presence being in that place that gives it the joy. That's what makes heaven so grand is the God whose presence we'll be in. And so we need to pursue Him for all of eternity. That's what we're going to do. We're going to be pursuing God. And that's what makes heaven so glorious. This is the whole point why we exist. God made us so that we can know Him. So that we can have a relationship with Him. All right, number three. We are studying the attributes of God so we can grow spiritually. So we can grow spiritually. This was Paul's prayer in Colossians. He says in Colossians chapter 1, in verse 10, it says, Paul says, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. And so Paul connects the knowledge of God, knowing who God is, with our spiritual growth. And so we can't grow spiritually apart from knowing God. Letter A, we gain understanding through our knowledge of God. That's how we gain understanding. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Is understanding. So knowledge of God is where we get understanding. That means that if we don't have a correct view of who God is, then we lack understanding of the world around us. We don't understand reality right. We don't understand the world. We don't understand ourselves. right? It's, it's through knowing who God is that we correctly see ourselves, that we understand the purpose which we were created, and all of those things. So if we have a wrong view of God, then those things are going to fall apart around us. Um, having uh, the correct knowledge of God, it helps us to understand the truth more deeply. And so that means it protects us from false beliefs. So when we don't know the truth about God, what we do is we make a God up in our own mind. And that's called idolatry. And then we want to worship that God that we've made in our own mind. It's no different than making a God out of wood. We want our mind to be, we want to think on God correctly. We want our mind to be instructed by God's word so that we know who God is and we know him in truth. Also, understanding who the Lord is, it protects us against being apathetic towards sin. In 1 Corinthians 15.34, Paul says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. And I speak this to your shame. And so Paul says, because of all these problems that was in the church in Corinth, they had all these sin issues. And Paul says, because of these issues, because of the sin, the, the root cause of that is that you have no knowledge of God. 
You don't know who God is. And they had a low view of God, and so they were apathetic towards the sin that was in their lives. And so that's what happens to us when we don't have a correct understanding of God. The next one, uh, letter B. We grow in godliness and holiness through knowing God. So we grow in godliness. That's why we need to know God. Because that's how we grow in godliness. 1 John 3, 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sins not. Whosoever sins hath not seen him, neither known him. And so knowing God keeps us from, from sinning and it helps us to grow in godliness. Because when I see who God is and I understand that God is holy, it drives me to holiness. Right? It's the knowledge of who God is that leads me to live the right way. And so the more I learn about God, the more I see my own weakness and my own sinfulness, and the more I trust in Him, and the more I lean on Him for strength, and the more that I'm going to, um, to have His Spirit have more control of my life, which is what being filled with the Spirit is. Letter C. We know God better, we know God better so we trust Him more. That's what it is. We trust Him more. So when we know God better, we're going to trust Him more. Psalm 9.10 says, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. So the, the more we know about God, the more it's going to cause us to trust him. Right? Because when we see the great faithfulness of God, we know that he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. Knowing the goodness and the kindness of God that he puts up with a sinful wretch like me. Right? That, that gives me confidence in who he is and in my eternal security. We know that we get strength and joy and wisdom from God. And all of those things give us comfort and peace. And all of that comes from correct knowledge of who He is. Um, letter D. We are strengthened by our knowledge of God. We are strengthened by our knowledge of God. In Daniel 11.32 it says, But the people who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Paul Washer said, the more we know about God, the stronger we will be spiritually, and the more willing and able we will be to actively live for Him, regardless of the obstacles. So the Bible says that when David was in great trial, that he was greatly distressed, but then it says he strengthened himself in the Lord. It was his relationship with God that carried him through the difficulties in his life. It was what he knew about God that strengthened him and carried him through, which is what letter E is. Our knowledge of God carries us through difficulty and trial. Our knowledge of God carries us through difficulty and trial. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I am committed unto him against that day. And so Paul's writing the letter of 2 Timothy. This is probably the last letter he wrote before he was martyred. And he kept the faith unto the end, and he tells Timothy why. He says, because I am persuaded that he is able to keep me, that, that I know who has saved me, I know who God is, and so I'm not afraid. And that was what allowed him to persevere. Our, our whole life is lived through the power of God and through knowing him. There, there is no other way, there is no other thing for us to boast in. Right? It's the scripture that I read Sunday morning, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. It says, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That we know God, that's what we boast in, because that's where my strength comes from, that's where my joy is, and that's where I get the strength to live the Christian life. There's nothing good in me. Anything good that people see is, is him, that's him in me. And so I boast only in the fact that I know him. Paul says the same thing in Galatians. Um, in Galatians 6.14 he says, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I glory in the cross. Why? Because the cross is how I know God. If it wasn't for the cross, I wouldn't know God. So if I'm going to boast in knowing God, I have to boast in the cross. That's all I have. Because it's through the cross that I know Him. We know God not because we have a certain kind of virtue or because we're smarter than someone else or more special, but because of Christ. And that's why we boast in the cross. All right, number four. We are studying the attributes of God because Jesus died so we can know God. Jesus died so that we could have a relationship with God. And for us to just simply ignore what the Bible teaches us about who God is, is ignoring the fact that Jesus died so that we can know God. A study of who God is isn't just learning facts on, on paper. 
It's learning truths about who God is and then seeking those things out. It's intellectually, but it's also an experiential thing. right? It, our relationship with God is more than just reading words on a page. But it's, it's knowing God in prayer and worshiping Him and, and having a real active relationship with God. And we've been reconciled to Him by the blood of Christ. And so we need to have a growing relationship with God. Number five on the back of the page. We should study the attributes of God because God is exceedingly worthy. Because God is exceedingly worthy. We have been made so that we can know God. And then we were separated because of our sin. And then Christ died to bring us back to God. And we have been given this great privilege, not only of being reconciled to God, but having our own personal copy of God's Word. Christians lived for sixteen or 1,700 years before many of them were able to have their own copy of God's Word. And we have our own, and we can open it up, we can read and learn about who God is. God is worthy. He is worthy of us to, to study and, and to seek Him out and to know Him. Now, the word worship, I don't know if y'all know this, the word worship comes from an old English word that means worth-ship. It means to ascribe worth to someone, to, to proclaim how worthy they are. That's what worship means. And so, when we say that God is exceedingly worthy, that He is worthy of our worship, we're saying He's worthy of our devotion, He's worthy of our lives, He's worthy of our time to sit down and open up this book that He's given us, to learn who He is, that we've been created for Him and for His good pleasure, and we're made to glorify Him and to know Him. And so we should take advantage of that. In fact, God is so worthy that we are commanded, um, and this is what the, the next four are, A, B, C, and D. We are commanded, first, we are commanded to sing to Him. We're commanded to sing to Him. In Psalm 138.5 it says, They shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. So we're commanded to sing to God. Um, letter B, we are commanded to seek Him. We're commanded to seek Him. In Psalm 111.2 it says, The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. And so we should seek God because of His greatness. Letter C, we are commanded to praise Him. In 1 Chronicles 16.25, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And then letter D, we are commanded to proclaim His greatness to others. In Deuteronomy 32.3, he says, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. And so we're commanded to do these things. We're commanded to praise God, to proclaim His greatness, to seek after Him, and, and to sing to Him. But we can't do any of those things if we don't know, if we don't have the knowledge of who God is. We can't obey those commandments without knowing who God is. And so we have to understand that God is worthy of our study and worthy of our time because He is the Creator. He is the Creator that made us. And because of that fact alone, He is worthy of our endeavor to seek out and know who He is. Something from Psalm 95. It says... Um, Psalm 95 and verse 5, it says, The sea is His, and He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And so we're supposed to worship God because He is the Creator, because He made us. And that simple fact alone means we should worship Him. But more than that, in verse 7, He says, For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. And so we should worship God not just because He's just the Creator, because He's my God. He is my God that has reached down and He has saved me. And He has a personal relationship with me. And He is worthy of worship because He's the Creator. But He's worthy of worship because I know Him. And because He is the great God that has saved me. And then in Psalm 18, it says, this is how personal David makes it. He says, I will love Thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. And so David says nine times the personal pronoun my in those few verses. And he's making a point that it was his knowledge of who God was, his personal relationship with God that carried him through. And that's what we have to have. We have to understand that it's God is worthy. He has revealed himself to us and he is worthy of our devotion. He's worthy of our lives. Because he doesn't owe us anything. He owes us nothing. In fact, if he, the one thing He does owe us is justice. And He owes us destruction and death. That's what we deserve. But in His mercy, He's given us grace and He's revealed Himself to us and allowed us to have a relationship with Him. And we should take advantage of that. 
And as we go through this study, um, when we start getting into the actual attributes, we're going to look a lot at Jesus because the Bible says that Jesus is the only one who has seen the Father. He's the only one that's went to heaven and come down. So he's the only one that is able to explain those things to us. He's the only one that is um, qualified to do that. But also, the Bible teaches us that God has revealed himself to us in the pages of the Bible. And that's why we're not just going to look in the Gospels when we're studying the attributes of God, but we're going to look at all of Scripture because God has revealed himself in the pages of the Bible. Um, So I don't want this to be just like a little series that we do on Wednesday night. Um, I want this to be something that you can add to your daily meditation on God's Word. That You can take an attribute of God in your morning time or whenever you do your personal devotion time with the Lord and meditate on a different attribute of God each week. Um, and by doing that, uh, this is the last four things on there. So the challenge I put on here is to take a few minutes each day at your personal devotion time and meditate on an attribute of God. And there are four things that it will do for us. Number one, it will cause you to see your personal devotion time as a privilege, not a chore. It'll be a privilege, not a chore. It'll change your attitude from supposed to to get to. Right? I, it's not that I'm supposed to do this. I'm, I get to do this. I get to spend time in the presence of the Lord and thinking about how great He is. Number two, it will remind you of the importance of the Bible. Because we, we can know God from creation. We can look around. The Bible tells us that we can know the invisible attributes, certain things about God because of creation. But we can't know specifically who God is. And that's why we have the Bible. And so when we take our Bibles and we learn about who God is from it, we understand how important the Bible is to us and how much we need it. Because it's impossible to know the God of the Word without knowing the Word of God. Number three, it will change how you view yourself. It will change how you view yourself. So you'll understand yourself better in light of who God is. Um, We'll be better grounded in the knowledge of God. And when we are, it keeps us from empty philosophy and worldly thinking. And it keeps us from being prideful. And it keeps us from trusting in ourselves because we understand how great God is and how sinful we are. Um, Anytime in the Bible you see someone that gets in the presence of God, they always confess their sin. They always see how evil they are. And that's because of how glorious and how great God is. And so the more we think on that, the more we're going to see ourselves in true light. Uh, And then the last one, it changes how you view others. It changes how you view others. Knowing God and being reminded of His goodness and His patience and His love and His mercy that He has towards us causes us to be that way towards other people. It causes us to, to love others because they're created in the image of God. And so we want to love other people and we want to treat them right because God is good and because God is patient with them as well. Um, so that was kind of an introduction. Um, next week we're going to look at the glory of God and how God is incomprehensible, how we can't fathom God, um, but then at the same time how we can know God. Um, so we're going to look at how God is majestically awesome Father, we thank you, we praise you, Lord, because you are worthy of our worship, Lord. You are worthy of our devotion and our time and our study and our our mind. Lord, we pray that you would help us, Lord, that we could love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. God, we pray that you would uh, reveal yourself to us this week as we think on who you are and as we read your word um, and we meet you in prayer. Lord, we just pray that you would pour your spirit out on us, that you would help us to understand Uh, ourselves and see ourselves in light of the truths of your word, but Lord, more than that, that you would reveal yourself to us, and Lord, that you would help us, that we would know you in a deeper way. We thank you, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.